Okay, so um, today we've got a, a special session um, where we're invited um, Josh Twist, who's now one of the um, program leads for integration at Microsoft, to come and join us on Integration Monday, but it's not on a Monday. Um, the idea was Josh was going to be at the London Biz Talk Summit, but um, for for some reason couldn't make it, and um, Josh um, was replaced by his boss, who did an awesome keynote session. But um, Josh really wanted to be able to engage with everybody in the community and kind of um, open up a, a bit of a discussion about some of his thoughts and plans, and also um, open up the opportunity for some questions and some feedback, and, and really kind of just get this um, sort of two-way collaboration going between the community and Microsoft, which I think will help us all in the integration space. Um, so the, the sort of format for tonight's session is um, Sarah Vanner and I have collected some questions over the last few days. We've got quite a few of them and probably too many to go through in one day. Um, but the idea is we're going to share over to Josh in a moment, who's going to talk to everyone a little bit about um, some of his plans and then after Josh is done, we're going to leave about sort of half an hour, 20 minutes to go through some of those questions. And um, Sarah Vanner and I will, will kind of ask um, questions to Josh on behalf of the people who've raised them, and, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about some of those. So I hope this is the kind of session that everybody's really interested in. I know we had a lot of people sign up, especially since we um, kind of missed the fact that it collides with the build keynote. So uh, I'm sure most of you have got the keynote going on in the background on your iPads or something. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to Josh now, and we'll we'll get cracking with today's session. Thanks. Hey guys, uh, hopefully you can can hear me. I don't know if someone can acknowledge that in some way over audio. Oh yeah, I get a little I am saying yes. And can you see my screen? I'm not used to this join me um, conferencing tool, so uh, uh, loud and clear. Can you see the screen? such a noob. Yes, I'm going to assume that's a yes, you can hear the screen and not yes, you can hear me. Um, uh, first of all, thanks to, to, to Mike and to Sarah Vanna for giving me the opportunity to um, uh, to join Integration uh, Wedner's Monday, um, or whatever we're calling this, this unusual gig. And likewise, um, I just finished watching the, the keynote myself here in Redmond from the room we were pumping the live stream into. Um, and appreciate seeing, you know, 70 folks, I think, online um, coming to chat. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to basically um, introduce myself um, to, this, to, this, um, to this community, uh, to open a channel for engagement so that you guys feel that you can reach out to the, to the engineering team that's driving integration here at Microsoft um, easily and readily and that we're going to be responsive. Um, I don't want to spend too much time doing slides and demos, and sure, you know, time permitting, we'll do some of that. I really want to make sure that we're using this opportunity for a discussion. We can schedule many um, presentations for doing demos, for doing best practice guidance, etc. In the future, so let's make sure we use this for um, uh, to really, to really dive into the discussion, have a frank exchange. As you know, I'm I'm new to the role, so I'm really looking to the community out there to help us make sure we're making the right decisions and making the right prioritizations. So I'm going to pull up some slides. I, again, this is going to be a very, very relaxed presentation from my point of view. Let me move this thing. Um, a very relaxed presentation um, in terms of presentation structure and whether we even do a demo can be dr driven by um, can be driven by you guys because I imagine most of you, given the, that you're interested in this space, have seen some of the, the demos that we're doing on Logic Apps, but I'm happy to do one anyway. Um, so as I said, mentioned, primarily it's an opportunity for me to, to, to meet and greet the folks from Integration Monday and the integration community run by um, Mike Saravana and gang. 
let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a, a program manager here in, in Redmond. As you can tell by my accent, I'm actually from the UK. I've been working at Microsoft for about nine years. Um, my first four years were as a consultant in Microsoft UK, and I actually have a long um, background in, in, first of all, I worked at an ISV developing, and then I was an application development consultant with Microsoft. Um, helping people to build solutions on, on Microsoft technology. And that was a variety of things, you know, did a lot of UI, but I also did a lot of back-end work and even did some BizTalk consulting, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little while, um, uh, with BizTalk server back in 2006, maybe 2007, uh, near those golden years as Sam and the gang from Codeit like to refer to that, that time period. Um, I then moved to the States, to Redmond, to go and work on the product groups. And I, I wanna speak for a second about the reason I did that. Um, is I really wanted to go and impact the technology. I had been working with the technology shipping out of the product groups for some time and had a lot of passionate ideas about how I think we could do things better, how um, uh, we should prioritize things like experience and learning curve. And I'll talk a little bit about that with respect to the, the new world I've taken over here. Um, when I came uh, over to Redmond, I worked on workflow. So the old workflow foundation. Um, that I expect many of you guys are familiar with for a brief period before being the first full-time member of something called Azure Mobile Services. If you remember that, I was uh, uh, part of the team that founded that effort. Um, and then I took over um, Azure API Management and I was a deal lead on the acquisition to buy Epiphany, which was a company out of Washington DC that bootstrapped Azure's effort into launching um, an API management solution. And then most recently, um, uh, I was asked to um, uh, take on a new role here in the application platform team and leave API management behind and pick up um, integration, I think is probably the, the easiest way to summarize my, my new purview, um, which includes uh, uh, a section of app service because app service is our strategic direction for integration in Azure. But I also own um, BizTalk Server, uh, a couple of pieces of, of the workflow technology, and I'm generally seen as sort of responsible for driving our integration um, strategy going forward here in Azure Application Platform. Um, I think to talk about that in a little bit more detail, the reason I accepted this role, um, it's a space I'd been, I'd had an eye on. I'd had some um, involvement in that space just because API management is so, you know, is somewhat interrelated. There's a lot of, there's some overlap and we certainly have overlapping customers. Um, so there's, uh, you know, that I, I was had an eye on on the integration space anyway. Also have some background in that from my consulting days, and had been seeing for some time an increasing need for a better capability in this space. So for me, driven by this, driven by two factors: the explosion in best of breed systems that's caused by this adoption of SaaS and PaaS that we're seeing today. I mean, I. The way technology is adopted in the enterprise today is just changing so rapidly um, to what was unthinkable to me as a consultant when I worked with enterprises. It was literally unthinkable that a department would go around central IT, take out a, a credit card, a corporate credit card, and just start expensing a, a service they want to use. They're just going to go it alone and go and start using a service. Step forward to 2015, and that's almost becoming the norm now. You know, we. Even here in Azure, um, I have a number of services that we just pay for on our corporate card, like Trello, and um, you know, and, and we use Salesforce for a bunch of things as well. We literally choosing what is the right tool at the right time for the right job, and just moving forward unhindered by um, uh, too much governance. But that's creating a ton of pain for us. Actually, in the API management team, um, we had one of the PMs write some code that really would have been much better suited to a grown-up integration platform, to a to a, an integration solution that um, really offered the benefits and the reliability and checkpointing and manageability that we need. But at the time, we didn't have the skills. We didn't have, I know it sounds unbelievable, but we didn't have a BizTalk server guy on hand who could help us do this. And we didn't have the connectors for the different technology that we needed. So it was plainly obvious to me uh, that there was a need. Josh, uh, Josh, it's Sarana again. Are you showing any slides? Because people can only see the introduction slides. 
Oh no, I'm just I'm just talking at the moment. I'm just okay, showing that okay, slide. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. I have another slide right now. Apologies. I should have come up. I wanted to make this as relaxed and informal as possible. So, I have I have no slides to this background story. Um, so where was I? Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why this role was exciting to me and in coming into the integration space. And the other was I wasn't the only person seeing the need. So the leadership here in Azure um, is very strongly getting behind the importance and need for a modern integration capability here in Azure Application Platform. Is they see the need for all the same things. And to back that up, actually, what we're seeing now is we're taking the BizTalk team that was working out of India, and we're moving that uh, that team over into Redmond. In fact, the first few folks have already arrived. And I think that just shows that we're doubling down on that investment, you know, that we, we really see it as important and we're gonna uh, do everything we can to accelerate pace in that area. And in some cases, um, having those guys local can help us move a little bit quicker. And so that's what we're doing. So I really just wanna uh, give a note there that says, look, this is important to us. Um, we're gonna double down on this space now. And that's why I was excited to take this new role and accelerate integration application platform. Um, there are a couple of other things that are exciting about it as well. I've mentioned this to um, to Mike and Savannah and Kent and some of the guys I've spoken one-to-one -one with is one of the things I love about the space is the, the community that surrounds Microsoft integration. Um, I feel very lucky to be inheriting the opportunity to work with you guys. It takes a long time to build a community with this kind of passion. It's very difficult and you don't get it for free. And I appreciate the uh, the interest the energy and the passion that you guys have. I hope um, we can leverage that and we can work together as partners and um, go and do some really awesome stuff. Um, let me show a chart that maybe you've seen, maybe you haven't yet, but this was um, when I was when I was internally actually trying to get the team excited about the opportunity of what we can go and do. Um, this was a way uh, offshoring is not dead. Um, and actually having stuff happen in, uh, I'm just answering one of the questions that came in on the um, the chat window there. Um, I think we all know that sometimes having people in the same office can accelerate things. Um, that isn't um, to say that there isn't value in having teams distributed around the globe. I mean, just look at some of the most successful businesses and you know growing businesses in the world today, like GitHub. I mean, that's a very scalable and um, interesting model. But I I think uh, we wanted to make sure that every single thing that could slow us up was out of the way for this new effort. And so we made the decision to move those guys over to join us here in Redmond. So this is a chart I've been drawing to help people understand where I am in terms of the opportunity before us. Um, and I often do it with uh, a little story around one of my uh, uh, experiences with BizTalk Server back in the day. So BizTalk Server is a, a tremendous product. Um, and I don't want to start my role by being the guy who just comes in and says bad things about the old product before we go and do version two. But of course, it would be remiss not to be realistic as well. So um, back in 2006, I was working with a large power company and they had, uh, for some reason in the software assurance agreement, they had some BizTalk licensing. They wanted to use it. And they had a simple problem they were trying to solve actually. They were trying to move, um, they were trying to move some files from an FTP server that were being pushed by a partner or another department and just strip those files to pieces and put them into a SQL database. And I'm sure for most people on this call, that would have been a very easy thing to achieve. Um, you'd have deployed that successfully. Unfortunately, this particular customer, it failed. It failed for a number of reasons. The IT guys that ran the infrastructure in their own data center were unfamiliar with BizTalk and didn't have time to learn how to manage it and felt you know, they, they opposed the project somewhat. The developers struggled a little bit with the learning curve of BizTalk server. Um, and even in this simple scenario, they, they couldn't deploy it. And so what I found with my experience over BizTalk was that the learning curve felt something like this. Um, the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve um, and the learning effort required, it really was a wall. It really was um, a, a, learning, a, a learning wall, actually, is, is kind of the, the joke I came to think of it as, is that once you'd learned this stuff, it was incredibly powerful. Um, and you could deploy it to solve extremely complex problems. But it created a kind of zone where no one would use it because it was just too hard to use it for simpler problems like the one I just described, which, you know, there's so many opportunities to solve those simple and inverted commas problems in the in industry today, just as I described some of the integration we were trying to do between Trello and our CRM system, for example. Um, 
that it, but it just would, would have been too much effort for that person to learn um, BizTalk Server in that case for this particular problem. So we have this unusual chart here. And this is one of the key things in my mind I want to tackle as we look forward to integration um, in, the, in the future here coming out of that plan. And that is that we'd like to build more of a learning line, you know, a genuine sort of learning curve that goes from, I have a simple problem, the solution is simple, to I have a complex problem, and the solution may be complex because complex problems require complex solutions. I am under no illusion here that we can have some kind of um, nursery level integration solution to solve some of the enormous challenges that, that we're solving today with BizTalk Server. But we do want to introduce this area where you can use the product for simpler solutions. And many of you will observe um, this by looking at the recent work we've done in Azure App Service. If you've tried out Logic Apps and the connectors that were We've still got a lot of work to do, make no mistakes here. I'm not, I don't talk about that as though we have reached um, maturity in any, in any stretch. We're very much in our crawl phase as we move to walk and run there. Um, but this is what's driving that and what's driving some of those changes is that we're trying to create this learning curve. And I think this has benefit for everybody. First of all, it gives us an opportunity to really grow the number of developers that work on the integration platform. Right now it is a, um, a percentage of all developers that consider themselves kind of integration specialists. I suspect that's many of the people on the call feel that they fall into that category. And we want to grow that dramatically, which should help you guys in terms of expanding your efforts, expanding your consultancies, et cetera, et cetera, expanding your partnership opportunities. And of course helps us to make sure that Azure is the best platform for integration um, it, of all options available in the cloud and of course on-premise. On-premise is still important to us. We know here in Azure, you'll, you'll hear us talk about this a lot, that we think hybrid is going to be a very, very strong thing for at least 10 years where people have on-prem and have um, cloud capabilities. Um, and we are invested in that for Azure App Service too. So that hopefully gives you a sense of some degree of how we're thinking about the, uh, of how we're thinking about the problem. Most familiar with um, Azure will know that we have a number of services in Azure today that are built really to kind of accelerate developers. And with one eye firmly on the, the kind of enterprise line of business space, um, here's three example technologies that we have um, that are generally available today. Azure websites, as I'm sure many of you know, the fastest way to build and host a, um, a, a web application or an API. If you have code written in pretty much any language um, and you want to deploy it quickly, have it managed, reliably scalable with auto scale, then Azure Websites is your, is your platform of choice. You know, it abstracts you nicely away from the OS and just allows you to focus on building web applications. We have mobile services, which takes that model, was actually built on Azure Websites, this technology I worked on earlier I mentioned. It's literally, uh, uh, a mobile service is literally an Azure website with some added stuff. And the stuff that is added is some built-in API, so just save you from writing that code and managing that code, and also a client SDK for, for all of the key mobile platforms like iOS, Android, Windows, and beyond. Um, and very, very popular for anyone building, uh, looking to build a, a back-end. As, as a PM worked on that solution for some time, one of the most common things that was requested was, can you help me connect this thing to my Salesforce backend or my Siebel backend or my SAP backend. So clearly there's a need for integration um, in both of these worlds, Azure websites and mobile services. And we did have one um, in terms of BizTalk services was our first version, our first shot at um, BizTalk built for the cloud. I'm sure many of you are aware that um, BizTalk server, again, a fantastic product, but probably needs some structural rethinking in order to make it really take advantage of a of the elasticity and scalability that people are expecting in the cloud world. And BizTalk Services was our first step in, the, uh, in that direction. And so you had a world here where we had these key app services, continuing to, to move them forward, but it created this, you know, people were often using them in composition. It was very common actually, you really got one without the other to some degree. And that creates a complex billing model, a complex view of the world. And we wanted to solve that problem by creating a single suite, and that is, Azure App Service. Azure App Service is the combination of these pieces um, brought together with a single billing model. And in fact, what's great about that is that you know there's just there's just one bill to pay. You get all of these capabilities. 
and you get all of these capabilities thrown in for the price. So, you know, for example, if you're a premium customer and you get all of the integration capabilities and app services, then you have thrown in as your website. You can go and host your websites on that infrastructure you're paying for without paying extra money. You have mobile services, again, without paying extra money. So all, all at one low price. One of the key things we did were, with our messaging around integration was evolve some of the pieces and break them out. So we created a new orchestration engine called Logic Apps. So we, lot, there was no orchestration engine, as you know, in BizTalk services. There was really just connectivity bridges. Um, there was no workflow solution. Now, we've been working for some time on a new workflow solution that's based on a highly scalable Azure deployment engine, also known as Azure Resource Manager. That is the foundation of, of, of Logic Apps. I'll talk a little bit more about Logic Apps in a second. And then we wanted to combine that with the, sorry, I keep seeing these IMs coming in. <laughs> I use the word orchestration. We wanted to combine that with this awesome platform for hosting isolated web applications that we could leverage to form the connectivity fabric for our next generation integration solution. And that's API apps. So let's go and talk about Logic Apps and API apps and how they combine um, to make our a better story. I'm going to skip over. Um, I'm going to skip, skip over this slide about Azure Websites here. I think everyone knows what Azure Websites is. If not, I'll send you some links. Now, um, BizTalk Services, you guys are familiar with this to some degree. Um, it was a great validation for us. Um, clearly needed more investment. We, we heard that loud and clear, and it clearly needed long-running workflows and orchestrations and new capabilities. And I think one of the biggest pieces of feedback we got was around the the um, spectrum of connectivity that was provided. We didn't have enough connectivity options. And with the release of Azure App Service, we've already accelerated that significantly now with over 40 connectors, introducing a lot of social connectivity, a lot of um, SaaS and PaaS connectivity, in addition to all the connectivity that was already available inside um, BizTalk services. So we really want to do a few things. We want to, uh, in terms of this vision, um, I mentioned already that we want to democratize integration. We want to make it so it's not just a small niche of integration specialists that can do this stuff. We want to extend that audience and grow this community and double down on this community. That's what we think of as democratizing integration. We want to, we're still committed to integration in terms of the seriousness of the business. One of the, the misperceptions um, that uh, we've had is because we've we've shown some of the new stuff in terms of Facebook connectors and Twitter connectors and someone says is this not a serious integration platform now is this just for social and you know for not at all we're really showing that we've, we've shown some of the new stuff and that's why that that has been misconstrued but we are very focused on making this new platform an IPaaS leader we want to make it a leader in the Gartner reviews we want to make it a leader in all of the analyst um, uh, um, analyst reviews of the technology, which means that we're really committed to enterprise quality features. We know we have work to do that, and you know we really appreciate the feedback that we're receiving and hope to continue to receive more um, and more engagement from you guys on what are the top things we need to do. Um, but we are fully committed to making this a, a leading enterprise platform. Um, and we want to grow a, a rich ecosystem. I've already mentioned very briefly the, the connectivity framework, which is the API apps. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But we have a marketplace of these API apps. And in time, it's not available today. In time, we plan to open up that marketplace to get partners such as the people on this call and beyond to come and add their capabilities, their, their offerings, their specialist skills, and uh, provide those in the marketplace and resell those through our marketplace and make it very, very easy and turnkey for, for customers to adopt um, um, partner solutions so that you're a Logic Apps user, but you're also the user of you know, something that's been built by one of the partners that are on the call and beyond today. Um, so let's talk briefly about Logic Apps. So um, I'm guessing everybody on here has heard about Logic Apps at this point. Uh, if if you would like a demo, um, I do want to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions. I'm already coming up on the sort of half hour mark. If you would like a demo, then please shout um, over the IM window. I've got one big no. I'll give you a demo. Um, but I think what we'd ra what I'd rather do is get through these slides, let's go and do Q&A, and then I would like to pull in specialist people from the team to join and offer sessions to this community where we deep dive on this stuff, like no hello world demo, let's go and see how we can do you know, the, the VEDA pipeline or how we can do EDI using this technology. Um, 
Now, is this yes, please? I'm hearing about a demo now, or is it about the other demo that I that I was talking about? You want a quick demo? I will, I will, I will, I will throw together a quick demo for you guys. Then, okay, we'll do that in just a second. Um, so, Logic Apps. Um, very briefly. Um, Logic Apps is the new capability in Azure that is part of Azure App Service, so included in that price. Um, it has a logo of a rocket. Sometimes I'm asked why we have a rocket, but I want you to notice that the trajectory of that rocket is going to take us into the leader quadrant of the um, analyst reviews, is my little running joke there. Um, yeah, we'll do a demo. Don't worry, I'll do a little demo. Um, it is a no-code designer, um, so we have a visual design experience, which I'll show you in just a second, that allows you to um, build uh, orchestration, and it's I like to use the phrase born of the web. This thing thinks differently. It does not think in XML. It does not think in WCF. It thinks in terms of HTTP, in terms of JSON, and in terms of Swagger. So very modern um, uh, standards. Of course, we provide capabilities to allow you to deal with XML. We realize that's critically important, but that's done via extensibility. At its heart, this is a reliable checkpointing orchestration and workflow engine that thinks in HTTP, that thinks in JSON, and thinks in Swagger, and allows you to invoke our extensibility points, our connectors, which are just REST APIs. Um, so only one person who didn't want the demo, it seems. Um, and he's going home now. I like it. <laughs> Okay, so I think you're getting it. I think a demo will explain uh, more of this. Um, but I would also want to point out one thing. This really is a platform. Um, Logic Apps is a platform. The the code that underlines this, we have a declarative um, description language, which is built in JSON, can be used by other partners to build their own UIs for this. You don't have to use our UI. Our UI is included. It's targeted at technical people, at developers. But if you want to build a solution that is perhaps for business users, that is perhaps specific to your domain, then you can absolutely do that using the management APIs for Azure App Service and just push in these definitions and then read out um, progress, instances, et cetera, from the API. No Twilio in the demo. Look, I'm going to be putting a demo together based on the API apps I have available in my in my container. So we will see we will see what I can what I can what I can muster for you guys. Um, I hadn't actually planned to do a demo. I should have done, obviously. I'm sorry. I can't please everybody. Some guys are saying demo. Some guys are saying no demo. What I do commit to is. Um, what I what I do commit to is follow up sessions with other people in the team to give deep dive into whatever you guys would like to. And maybe we can do a, I don't know, maybe we can have a public Trello board or something where you guys can suggest what you'd like to see. I will not be demoing Minecraft today, but I think we have someone on the call who could probably help us with that if we wanted to. Um, API apps. So these are, again, they're built on Azure websites. Um, and they are extensions to Azure websites that add some capabilities. The key thing here is we're trying to make it easier for people to build connectors that can be used with API app, uh, with, with logic apps um, and beyond. So if you build a web API, you can easily host it as an API app. That gives you metadata that explains to the logic app how to draw the UI to make it easy to integrate that into your logic application. So if you want to if you want to take our example marketplace API apps that we have in there, like the Salesforce connector, for example, and add your own so that you can um, so take these that we have shipping out of the box today, and you want to add your own capability. Um, uh, so I'm just trying, the Minecraft consultant has gone to bed apparently. Um, if you want to take these so you can add your own capability, um, then you can do that using Visual Studio. Actually, you don't even have to use Visual Studio. Um, but you can upload an API app and add to your workflow so you can now communicate with your own systems or something that we didn't create. And as I mentioned, we plan to expand that ecosystem so that you can upload into our marketplace and share that with, with customers, et cetera, and that will be coming in the future. OK, so I will do a very quick demo. Let's switch over to the portal. And then I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. And remember, let's talk about as well about um, things you guys would like to see in future sessions that we can do with you, where we'll do much more deep dive demonstrations to tackle the questions that you have. I was looking forward to the conversation today. Um, I have a workflow. Let's go and find that one I just created, actually. So we have a Wednesday Monday workflow. Let's have a look what API apps we've got um, available over here. 
that I have already created in my resource group. I think I've got a bunch. Uh, so we have a HTTP connector, we have a Yammer connector, Salesforce, and a, I have a Slack connector as well. So let's do something with um, Slack and Yammer and HTTP. So I could choose that this is a workflow that I want to run manually. And all I do is just click this little checkbox down here, and that'll allow me to run it manually. I'm going to run this one on a recurrence schedule. So what I'm going to do is run this guy every hour. So I can set that to run for, you know, every two hours. I just want it to run every one hour. I could set it to minutes. Or if I'm in the premium tier, I can set it to run on a uh, per second cadence. Um, let's go for every hour, I think, will work for now. I check that in, that saves that particular card, and I can actually save my workflow as I go. Uh, the first thing we're going to go and do is make a call to uh, a HTTP endpoint. So I'm going to go and get a web page. I'm just showing you um, how easy it is to make uh, HTTP calls from this. And we just pushed an update here, and I can't click yet. Oh, there we go. Yep, there it goes. I'm going to type in my URL. I'm going to go and just grab um, some. I'm just going to go and grab some web content. Actually, it's going to grab the content of example.com. I could go to any web page here. I can set my authentication. I can set my headers, etc. So I'm going to save that. And then what I'm going to do a little bit randomly is I'm going to post this to a Yammer group. Um, so let's. This isn't a particularly useful workflow I'm building, but what I'm showing here is how I can compose these different API apps. That's what I'm looking at on the right, and do things with them. Now these. These steps are all checkpointed. So once I've pulled this URL and loaded the content, it's stored in my workflow. It's stored durably. So if something happens and the machine goes down and that kills that, that machine, then when that machine when we come back up, we'll bring your workflow back to life. It's been durably stored and we'll carry on going um, from that point on. So a key feature for, for integration scenarios is, you know, particularly where you just can't have loss of data and you want to run as close to um, at least once as possible. Now I'm going to actually post the content of this to my Yammer connector. Um, so I need to just sign into my Yammer account. And I'm going to go and sign in over here as well, actually. So let's do it to go to my Microsoft.com Yammer account. Uh, where did my pop-up window go? Oh. It all sounded a bit funny there. I'm going to try that again. And if you guys have feature suggestions, actually, I just saw some some asks for um, features down there. Then our user voice is a great place to go and put them and put your weight behind them as a community. So if you go to feedback.azure.com and then we'll scroll down the list on the right, you will see that we have a logic app. Um, a Logic Apps user voice, then get in there and say that you would like control over checkpointing and, and draw people's attention to it. So here I have um, a group in Yammer. I'm going to uh, post to this. Let me move this guy out of the way. As you can see, I often use this for my <laughs> for my testing of of um, Logic Apps. I cannot move this window. That's painful. Okay, what I want to do is grab the URL. So I'm going to do this another way whilst I can't move that little thing here because I need the group ID. Let's go back to my workflow. And what we're going to do is post a message to this group ID. And the message could just be some text saying like, hello world. But I want to show you how you can also pipe information from the previous cards into the next card. So let's actually say that we want to post the content of this message should be the body of the response that came from our HTTP card. So I'm going to save that. And then also what I'm going to do, actually, is post to my Slack. So Slack is one of the things we're using here in my team. Um, let me open up my Slack here. And um, opening up. And I'm going to authorize into Slack. I'm going to sign in. Forgotten who I am. Oh, it needs my two-factor authentication code, so I better get my phone out. Uh, uh, uh. Notice that we work with 2FA as well. Where is Authenticator on my phone? There it is. 
Okay. Hope no one's logging in at the same time as me. Okay. Let me authorize this application. And now there we go. I have uh, my Slack um, is ready. And actually, we're going to post. Let's also do the same thing in Slack just to show you how easy it is to pull this stuff together. So let's also let's post the body. And the channel name is going to be uh, Logic Apps Test, uh, which is a channel I created specifically for testing stuff. So here we go. Uh, you can see I've been posting a bunch of stuff here as a bot. I am going to save that. And then when I hit save, we should start running this every hour and posting away to these different forums. Now, since this is a recurrence, I can actually make this happen manually by just hitting the Run Now button. So that's going to actually make it happen on a, a faster cadence. So if we go and take a look in here and refresh this screen, uh, actually, let's wait and see how we got on. So did this work? So notice that we have all the history shown here in the portal. So this would have the full history. Um, and oh, did it not get? Did I not get the saved version of my workflow? Well, let me just pop back into my definition a second. Make sure I'm running the latest version. Okay, it's loading up. Looks good. Go back over here. Let's hit run now and run this again. I think I ran the old version though. OK, and you can see that the HTTP connector worked and the Yammer connector worked. I'm not sure why I'm not seeing my Salesforce. I'll take a look at my uh, Slack connector. So if the Yammer connector worked, and one thing we can do here is we can have a look at the inputs that were passed to the Yammer connector. So we can see um, that the message body was passed there. You can see all the information that was passed in. We can also see the outputs. Um, so the outputs say that the message ID was was this. That was the response we got from Yammer, and there was the date. So if I go back over here, you can actually see there's my post appearing in Yammer. It looks like something went wrong with Slack. Oh, no, there's my Slack post. So you can see the body um, also appearing as a post into Slack. So not the most compelling demo, admittedly. Actually, one that I could just do very quickly for you guys. I'm leaving. I want to make sure I leave 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, but shows how easily we can start to link these different services together. And one of the things we have, um, in addition to sort of this debugging capability here, uh, we also have a trigger history that can help you see, you know, when did triggers fire? Um, so this was the recurrence trigger fired at a certain time. If you have a SQL trigger that's polling SQL to look for data, you'll be able to now see the full history of the the trigger and then when it actually fired a workflow because it found some data. So very useful for debugging, but actually pretty rich for this brand new uh, workflow engine. How we have, you know, instance management. I can cancel these if they're in flight by pressing the cancel button, et cetera, et cetera. And we will add suspend and resume. And actually, you can see that here's the Slack connector showing up now as well. So you can see the inputs to Slack. And we'll also see output, which I assume has uh, the channel ID, the created at stamp, and the re -okay result was true. So again, all very born of the web, all very JSON-based, and very easy for you to bring your own API apps and extend um, uh, the system to use those. Um, let me show you quickly the marketplace that we have and the breadth of API apps that we have available. So just click on the marketplace. Hit API apps, um, and you'll see uh, the very healthy, um, and we have more here as well, the very healthy view in terms of we have um, deep integration capabilities, AS2, Edifact, BizTalk Rules Engine, XML Validator. And notice how for the, for the serious integration scenarios, we are carrying the BizTalk brand forward. We realize BizTalk is a brand that is um, very well recognized uh, by the integration community, by enterprises, and by analyst community. Um, but we also want to put a friendly face on integration, and hence why Logic Apps um, is the way that we kind of garner newbies, uh, web and mobile developers, and help them uh, meet their integration requirements over here. So on that note, hopefully that was an adequate ad hoc demo that shows the basic power of the, of the, of the solution. I'm very excited for you guys to go and try this. Go and try it. It's available publicly in Azure today. Um, uh, anyone can sign up. There's free offering where you can try it out for free. And then as usual, as I've mentioned, make sure you're getting your feature requests on to user voice. And we're very open to communication here, so you can always reach out to the team directly. We, uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter, and my email address is jtwist at microsoft.com. I'm very happy to be, to be pinged directly. Um, so should we do some Q&A? Mike and Saravana, how do you want to do this? 
Hi Josh, thanks for that. Um, well, I really liked that demo actually, just on the fly there. There was no, no pressure to deliver something that worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we've got some questions um, that have sort of been popped on the website. Um, I've basically um, grouped them into a, a few different types or categories. Um, and Saravana and I are going to basically share reading out the questions. So we're going to go category by category. And I think um, we've, we've got probably about uh, about a dozen questions, maybe, that okay. we've picked out. Because there, there was quite a lot on the website, so we've picked out probably the, the dozen most interesting ones okay. um, and, and most repeating ones. And if, if we get through them all, we'll pick some others. But if not, um, we'll, we'll just kick off. So I'm going to start um, with the a, a couple of questions that are kind of roadmap related. Yep. Um, so the first one was from... Uh, from Gis, who said, Josh, we've seen several times in the past year that because of unclear roadmaps and bad alignment between on-prem and cloud, yep. i.e. no unified end-to-end runtime designer governments, etc., that enterprise customers have chosen other vendors for their hybrid platforms. How's Microsoft planning on addressing that, and how will you make sure that Gartner um, to kind of minimize the list of cautions around choosing the Microsoft platform? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think we've definitely got some work to do there, but I think at a high level, there's a couple of things we're doing. So um, I'm guessing there'd be no argument that we need to evolve BizTalk to make it the right platform for the future, especially for the, for the cloud. And that's what we're starting on that journey now. Um, and I think I hope the community will be surprised at how fast we can move once we get the momentum going and we get through the um, this crawl stage that will move very quickly. A couple of things that we're committed to, though, we are committed to um, to BizTalk Server. So we will do a new version of BizTalk Server, a new major version next calendar year, that will support the latest SQL, the latest Windows, and will add new features. I do not know the, what those features are going to be today. I'm just being very honest with you guys, going to have a very honest exchange here. Um, uh, but I would love your input on what you think they should be, and we will do a prioritization ex um, uh, uh, exercise in the not too distant future and plan that. Now, obviously that means that that next major tick of BizTalk Server will get the full life cycle of support that you get with a major tick, so you've got 10 years of support, et cetera. But we're also committed to bringing the app service capabilities on premise as well. So what I would expect to see is a number of evolving pieces coming together. So we'll continue to evolve Azure App Service. We know that capability-wise it is behind BizTalk Server today, but we intend to change that. We intend to surpass the capabilities in BizTalk Server. And therefore, our strategy is very much on We'll have a cloud version of App Service. We'll have parity with an on-premise version of App Service, and you should see BizTalk Server and Azure App Service um, uh, evolve to intertwine over the future. And in terms of, they would become the same product in the future. If that makes sense. I don't have exact times for you on that. And when it comes to timing and roadmap, one thing I want to be clear about here: the the world has changed. We move extremely quickly now. We used to have to share a roadmap because there was nothing coming out of the product team to drive feedback for three years. You know, it was like a three-year ship cycle, something like that. As, as I'm sure you're aware, things have dramatically changed in the cloud era. We are shipping updates to Logic Apps every week. We're shipping updates to pretty much most Azure services on a weekly basis. And we'll even be going quicker than that, actually. We're, gonna, we're trying to increase our, our ability to push out new features so that we just push them out as and when we're ready. So you'll see multiple releases per week if that, you know, that's, that's the way we'll be running the team in the future. Um, what that does, though, is it allows us to take feedback from customers, and it allows us to evolve. You know, if you, if you guys are familiar with Agile, one of the ideas of Agile is you ship constantly, you have a tight feedback loop, and that means you often don't know today the product you're going to be building in a year's time. And that's something we've not only learned to accept, it's something we've learned to embrace and love. And hopefully you guys will come and embrace and love that with us because it gives you a lot of power in terms of driving product direction. It would be a mistake for us now to commit to things on a very long time frame. Um, sometimes we have to do that in certain cases, and you know, in the rare cases where we need to do that, we will. Um, but by and large, it's much more powerful for you as customers and for us as a, as a vendor, and for partners especially, for us to allow us to rapidly evolve our direction based on what are the real hotspots 
people are seeing and they're also keeping up with the rest of the world the rest of the world is um is changing very quickly in terms of how the computing world looks how the cloud world looks and the thing we think we should build now in my very genuine experience having run a couple of product teams here now will evolve very quickly and you'll see it evolve with us so so that's something we're very keen to embrace is this um, uh, a very dynamic roadmap that we'll have over the course of a year. I can speak to some degree about some of the high level things that we know are obviously important on the product today. There are, there are big gaps we have on the product today. We know this, we will go and fix them. Uh, things like application lifecycle management is a burning hot issue for us. We're gonna go and work on that. It's one of the things we're prioritizing. Um, bringing um, full tilt um, messaging patterns like sequential convoy, you know, uh, or in order message processing, et cetera, to logic apps and the API apps. These are all things we already have as priority chunk items. Some of the details in there will be looking forward um, to feedback from you guys on, on how we should best do that. So does that answer the question, Mike? Yeah, can I ask a follow-up question though, Josh? Um, just yep. a couple of things off the chat window. So I think one of, one of the things that you, you kind of said in, in the is um, around how this talk server and, and app service kind of become the same thing or not and, and that kind of brings the question up about um does that mean this talk server goes away and i think it would be good to just qualify or clarify what you mean by that because i, I just don't want that to stop all oh, right yeah no that's you know, a good I question just no. be really clear on that yeah, no, at this point, we have absolutely no plans to take BizTalk server away. It's uh, We're still fully committed to that platform. We're already starting to work on the plans for BizTalk 2016. Um, that is very much something we're we're committed to keeping it, to, to, to keeping in the marketplace. We know that it's a critical solution for a lot of customers. There are no plans to take that away. I, I think what, what we'll eventually see is, um, what we're going to see is some sort of a side set in terms of capabilities initially as we add new capabilities to Azure App Service. And we need to find a way to bring those to the BizTalk server on-premise capability. And so I don't, I don't have the full answers of exactly how we'll do that today based on this, what we've just talked about in terms of how we do planning today. We need to kind of take the first step is to get BizTalk Server 2016 out. Next step is to get Azure App Service on-premise out. And then we'll bring those, those things together, those capabilities. So do, do you think that... Can in the future, you'll kind of see a lot of customers that use both BizTalk server and app service side by side in some way. I, it's probably a, uh, definitely. I, I think that's that's inevitable in the in the early phases. Hopefully, we can provide a very integrated solution on that. I don't I don't think we have the detailed answer to that question, but you know, I guess to some degree we do we do certainly expect that. I, I wouldn't okay. be surprised to see some of those features we had to BizTalk 2016 being things that help make that easier. Um, but again, I don't have um, a committed list of exactly what that would be today. Cool. Um, so the next question for roadmap related stuff was, I know we've talked about this separately already. Um, Colin Mead raised the question about end of life for Azure, uh, sorry, for Windows Server app fabric being announced recently. Yep. Um, so that so there's some customers and partners are kind of raising questions about what that means and what the alternative and if people invest in that. And um, we just want to get your view on that, and if, if that's something somebody's picking up. Right, so you were breaking up a little bit there, but I think I think I can predict the question. Um, uh, App Fabric is not under my purview. I'm not the um, PM owner for that. Um, I, I guess. Uh, how do I think about the question that I think you're asking? Um, actually, Mike, can you ask I the think, question? That, yeah. I, I, but so, so I think the I think the problem here is that app, Windows Server app fabrics kind of fallen in a bit of a gap where nobody really from from a, an external perspective nobody really seems to own that anymore, and and the problem is that some customers are going to be hit by this end of life and don't really know what to do and and I think we all in the community view that as being part of the integration stack even though it's not a, not a BizTalk server thing, and what we're really hoping for is just somebody to stand up and go. That's something I I own. Um, this is what customers need to do. And I, yeah, I, you know, and, and what we're saying is we haven't got another point of contact other than yourself in the integration space to really find out what the. Got it. Yeah, you know, it does. What, what it does. Do. It does have an owner here in Redmond, so I'm I'm more than happy to relay the the message. So it sounds like the the feedback is. 
what what is the guidance around how to fill this gap in the near term and then what is the what is the long term view for this yeah. for these capabilities look like right yeah i i don't have the answer for you off the top of my head right now but i will certainly take that away and and take it up with the team in question um and i'm actually not aware of the personally not aware of the guidance that we've already shipped but i was under the impression that we did provide some feedback in terms of how to do this. I, I think there was some other questions you mentioned that I'll also take back to the team, other ideas um, about how to help the community with this space. I will take that back and, and discuss that with the folks here in Redmond that own that, that do uh, own that purview or have the responsibility for that. Make sense? Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah, no. um, Saravana, do you want to do the architecture ones now? Yeah, sure. Uh, George, there are a couple of architecture-related questions. One from Ken Queer. Uh, when can we expect more samples or architecture guidelines on how we should be using new app service platform versus uh, traditional desktop ones? That's a great question. Um, it is definitely a priority for us. The team right now is in the process. Of, so this is giving an excuse for, for why we don't have it today. We're, we're in the process of just moving over the team from from um, India, as I mentioned before. So the PM team is is just getting its act together effectively. I have one of the guys has arrived. We're still waiting on the others. As the team ramps up, I would expect our output in this space to increase significantly. I think knowing the scenarios you'd like to see covered you know, helping us prioritize that is, is critical. And uh, one thing I want to say to this community, which is already active, is please don't, please don't be passive on this stuff. You know, the, the, the guidance for the scenarios you'd like to see, we can go and start building that, but help us prioritize which scenarios, which areas, which, which patterns you'd like to see um, tackled first. And some of that will have to happen in lockstep with the product, as I mentioned already that there, you know, we know there are some gaps, things like sequential convoy, for example. You know, what are the most important things for us to tackle as a scenario? Um, we will generate A, the product capabilities we need to solve that, but if there are any missing, and B, the guidance to help you do that. And I'm actually pretty excited to work with the community on this stuff. Um, because obviously, you guys are the guys that know exactly what the customer needs because you work with them day in, day out, um, very directly in a, in a more intimate way than perhaps um, than perhaps we get to sometimes. And so I'm excited to leverage that. But yeah, that is that is planned. We have some other plans as well around sharing source for some of the API apps that we have. Um, I don't have a uh, an announcement today on that space, but it is definitely something we're trying to, um, we're, we're working on um, sharing with you guys. Okay, I think uh, sharing the source code of some of the connectors will be really useful uh, to learn and, uh, and build some new ones. Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's next, let's let's see what we can do on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Guy. Uh, what will determine if something is a best of API or logic app? Where is the line? And um, will you have a separate public roadmap for the category of standard Microsoft apps because it's a different development team? Um. So what is the line? I'm trying to understand the question. Yeah, I have difficulty as well understanding it. <laughs> okay, so I think what it's asking is, we have some capabilities built into Logic Apps, right? Like, um, uh, let's go back to the one I just built. Since you guys are still looking at me. Do you want me to, do you want me to put my two points worth in? Uh, if, you're, if you're there, right, maybe you can expand a bit more on the chat window. What makes an API app or Logic App a BizTalk app? What make, so so a, a logic app is definitely not a biz. Okay, let's talk about the taxonomy, and it, it probably is a little bit confusing. Logic apps can what can do two things. It can make HTTP calls, or well, it can do a few things actually. But two two primary things: it can make HTTP calls, or it can call API apps. Now, all of us know that in reality, an API app is just a HTTP call. Now, API apps that are focused on connectivity, we tend to think of as a connector. So if, if, if all it really does is provide some sort of connectivity to Yammer in this case, or Slack to this case, it's not doing much additional processing. It is, it is almost just a, um, uh, a protocol handler for um, uh, providing swagger for logic apps, for example. Then we think of that as a connector. So it's sort of drawing a Venn diagram here that says there are API apps. Some of those API apps that we think of as a connector. 
Some of them do much more than that. And these are typically, if especially if they're focused in the integration space, we think of those as a BizTalk API app. So that's things like it can do transformation. It can do XML validation. It, it has genuine um, horsepower focused on integration. We tend to, we tend to brand those a, a BizTalk API app. So the rules engine, for example. Um, uh, anything that does compute that's specifically focused on, on integration, we're probably going to brand that as a BizTalk API app. And that's really how we're thinking about the nomenclature. It's fairly loose. There is no hard rules around it. Um, and now in terms of capabilities that are in Logic Apps, we will expand some of the things you can do. So what you can see here is an expression language. You can actually do um, a simple math in here. You can do string concatenation. We have a, a library of functions that you can run. And we may actually take that further and provide some built-in things like JavaScript evaluation for, for, simple, for simple conditions. In fact, we already have that. You can actually add a condition to a card. Let me show you here. So I can add a condition here that says um, this, will only, this card will only execute if um, this condition is, if a particular condition that I set is true. Um, and that condition is an evaluation of, you know, um, uh, using this expression language, which is JSON M, which is a uh, based on JSON M, which is a Facebook um, open source standard for dealing with JSON. So that's how we think about those different things. Does that make sense? We should probably have a slide that describes this. I, I imagine it is actually pretty confusing. So that's a great question. Okay, Mike. Yeah, cool, guys. Um, so we'll jump into the BizTalk server section of questions we have now. Um, so we have, I think, to me, this is one of the most important questions for BizTalk server. So Michael, Michael Benaj says, um, it's really a question about how the available BizTalk on Azure infrastructure as a service. So um, his specific question is, in SQL Server, always on availability groups provides a rich set of options for high availability. Unfortunately, MSDTC is not compatible. Um, basically, he's kind of saying, is there any plans to offer highly available biz talk on Azure IaaS? I'm, I'm, I don't believe we do have a plan to do that. Um, uh, this is something can, certainly we can consider. You know, we can, we can. I, I don't know whether we want to put do a user voice for this or something uh, to put some weight behind it. But we have no plans to do that on um, on IaaS at this time. So I think um, my take on this, Josh, I'm, I'm sure I speak for a lot of people in here, but I think this is one of the best ways you can make a really significant impact into um, that that big learning curve hack zone piece of you know, every, every customer struggles to set up production based talk environments. And yeah, I think uh, for a, a, a bunch of customers, if we're able. Uh, I just want to add something here, Mike. It, you know, it's not for Azure uh, IaaS alone. It's also a problem for a lot of the on-prem customers as well because uh, we, you know, we do a lot of demos, and it's very rarely you see uh, customers having a proper DR setup. The main reason is due to the complexity of all this log shipping and the Bistock's own proprietary way of uh, handling backups and restore all those kind of things. Uh, taking advantage of SQL Server always on will will ease that process significantly and you can see more customers having a proper backup DR. So it could be one of the feature, proper feature requests for uh, 2016, uh, District 2016. Mm. Whoever made yeah, I mean, that my... suggestion, do they want to encode it to me and put it in an email to jtwist at microsoft.com? So I can, you know, I can put it on the list of things we'll, we, we, we would look at for 2016. So, so I'll send you that through, Josh. I mean, just, just to give you a bit more background, so next week's Integration Monday session yep. is um, a few of the guys are going to be talking about a third-party product called DataKeeper, which um, offers soundless clustering and it, it's just got um, got um, accreditation to run on Azure. Um, so we, we think this could be one of the ways of solving that problem, but it's not really been discussed in a biz talk space before. And it's not officially supported by the product group, so it might be quite interesting if you want to catch next week's session or, or at least catch the recording. Um, but I, I think generally that this kind of addresses a number of issues in the in the whole sort of make it easier to do biz talk space because we, you know, from from my side, what I'd really like to do is this thing um, a bit like what Scott Gu did at that conference a while back, where you can kind of two click build a SharePoint cluster on Azure in 10 minutes and if we can do something like that for biz talk 
um, that for for you know for really specialist customers who do massive volume, it might not work. But for those you know seventy eighty percent of customers who are just average BizTalk users, that might give them a really great way to to get BizTalk set up in a best practice way without needing you know massive investment and without needing specialists and stuff like that. Um. Yes. Yeah. I mean, send me the details. Uh, as you know, I'm I'm new to role onboarding and trying to get to grips with some of this stuff. So I'd, I'd need to understand it better. But certainly, uh, send me the suggestion, and we'll put it on the the table to look at as we do planning for. Great. For cool. Thing. But okay. Um. Next one's from Kent. So, Kent says, um, do you have any plans to be able to consume API Swagger uh, metadata from BizTalk? Um, so I guess this is a bit like importing a, a WCF service. You can just import the swagger and generate some BizTalk server artifacts. Yeah, and I mean, again, this is on user voice already. Again, we we have no fixed plan for what what is happening in the next version of BizTalk right now. Um, but again, this is a great suggestion, um, and um, would definitely be something that 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 could make sense. So. Um, yep, so keep so the... skipping the next question, is there a really good way, or what's the best way for us to give you? Um, feedback on what we would like to see in the next version. I think that's a good point, actually. And I wonder whether we should have. Let me come back to you on that. I will come back with an answer to that question. Cool. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll jump to API apps now. Sorry, Vanna. Yeah, I think that is a really interesting question from Ken Queer. Uh, are there any plans for the API app certification process? How do we know that someone's API isn't calling their home or it's full of bugs? Yeah, so um, the there are plans for that. Um, I don't have any details on exactly how that's going to work yet, but as we open up the marketplace, we're aware that we need um, some kind of certification um, process. So it has been discussed. Um, we agree with the concerns and the motivation and more details of that will be shared as soon as we have them. Okay. Uh, the next set of questions are around logic apps. I think you've covered some of them during your uh, short presentation. Uh, well, logic app, it's a question from Eric Morganson. Uh, will logic apps support order delivery? If so, will there be certain requirements of the pricing tier, uh, et cetera? But the question is basically, will you support order delivery in logic apps? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the messaging patterns that we need to add to the platform. It's one of the things that's on our kind of top five, top six things we need to go and tackle. Um, so I think the answer is yes. Um, I, uh, in truth, Logic Apps and, and BizTalk, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the pricing, really only light up in standard and premium tiers. Uh, below that, they're only for use in uh, development and test. Um, I couldn't speak to the pricing plan around the, the messaging patterns at this point. I'm, I'm not sure we, until we get closer to having that feature, we'll look yeah, at the pricing the main, at that the main point. thing is whether the feature will be available. Once yeah. it's available, then you can discuss the pricing afterwards. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we will, we will definitely have those. I don't have a fixed timeline for you, but I would expect it to be uh, in the not too distant future. Okay. Uh, the next question is also from Eric Morganson, but I guess this is one of the hot topics everywhere now. Will there be support for building logic apps using Visual Studio and uh, full ALM support? Uh, I want to separate full ALM support and Visual Studio. I mean, it is possible to do ALM support without VS, and we'll definitely improve ALM. We haven't landed exactly how we would do that. Um, uh, we're certainly talking about Visual Studio support. We realize it's a, a popular ask. Um, I would love to get some insights into what does, what is driving the request for Visual Studio support and really understand what that means. Because in and of itself, it's kind of a strange request. Um, is it because no, I, people... I, I can understand, uh, you know, like, of course, if we're having a thick client, you're going to have a better tooling. Uh, for example, if you take an orchestration designer now, you can get into properties window, you know, like uh, uh, getting the uh, defining messages and it. It is a classic, you know, browser versus thick client experience. When, especially when you're doing development, uh, it uh, speeds up things. Uh, but uh, so, so let me let me let me encode that. What you're saying is, you want people want Visual Studio because they want a native, uh, natively rendered graphical experience, not a web rendered graphical experience. 
that's kind of right. Yeah. So it gives, you know, like you can compare it to a richer orchestration designer, yeah. I guess one, one thing I could maybe do in Visual Studio would be have a couple of custom API apps that are in my code bases as web APIs and then a logic app and I can just publish them all to, to Azure as one one project and then the source control together. And I you know, I can start doing like the testing together and stuff. So to me, it, it kind of makes sense from the way people are used to developing, whereas at the minute, I think the problem with the logic app is, um, yeah, you've got this JSON there, but I'm going to have to keep exporting and importing it between environments and stuff. And and it kind of, it, it fits for the, the really simple, can I put something together in, 10 minutes and just get it straight into production. But for the way um, enterprise developments used to work, and I think there's, there's some challenges around how you'd, you know, how you'd do that whole ALM piece. Yeah, and also I think it just, uh, I was talking to Sam a couple of weeks ago, and we were discussing, you know, the approach, uh, what uh, the Azure machine learning team has taken. They have a really rich experience on the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, because the problem, what you have, the problem you have in Logic Cap is that you can see it on the command win, uh, see chat window, like uh, someone from Quick Learn uh, commenting, you know, portal journey that is 15 pounds deep, such uh, that's kind of a reality, right? So maybe I think you need a better, uh, better experience if you're just sticking with the uh, browser alone. It may require like a bit more uh, richer experience dealing with the complex scenarios. Um. So again, I'm trying to sort of boil this down to the requirements that are motivating the ask. So, so what I'm hearing so far is one is the a native graphical experience for performance reasons. Another is the 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 current Ibiza experience has a sort of 15 panes deep portal journey, which is painful. Mm -hmm. um, another is that VS is just where you live, and you don't want to go outside of it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I, I think it'd be really good. So, so on our user voice right now, we sort of it is definitely one. I think it's the most popular thing is to say provide Visual Studio integration. What like there's a couple of ways we could do this. You see, we could just have a web view in Visual Studio that works. We could we could go and build a fully native graphical designer. But bear in mind that building a fully native graphical designer, I, I want I want to I want you to help me prioritize. So going building that will suck up a lot of resources from the team. That means we're not going building perhaps that ordered messaging capability that you wanted. Or you know every team everyone here works in software, so everyone knows how this works. That it's all about prioritization. So I, I'm keen to understand the motivation so that we go and build the right thing and apply the right resources to the right problem so that we have the best product for you to go to market. Um, I saw one mention okay. of offline. I mean, how many how many people is is the offline development story where you're not connected to the internet? How many people is that critical to? But I guess when you bring the the on premise uh, migration, like you know, when you have a uh, Azure Pack or whatever the new name equivalent is, that will give an offline experience, right? Well, potentially. I mean, the the, the plan doesn't. Uh, I wouldn't. Let's not assume so. Let's let's um, let's okay. imagine for a second that on-prem doesn't run on a workstation. You know, you you need something meatier. Um, I I'm I'm keen to understand. Uh, one one other thing is, I'm curious. All the people that have said that they need offline, is that because they do a lot of development without network connectivity? Yeah, a lot of yes on the chat. Right and is now. that because yeah, you're on the train or in a taxi or or, or <laughs> what? What's the deal? You don't, don't have that's that's going to be because you're doing biz talk development, though, isn't it? You're not doing cloud development when you're not connected to the network. So you, uh, to me, you've got to think that these things are different things. But I, I still think, to me, the, the Visual Studio support is important because you need somewhere to source control all of your stuff in one place. And right. At the minute, right. at the minute, you don't really get that. And no, no, but I, I almost, I do feel those can be sort of teased apart a little bit in terms of there's ALM mm. and there's the designer experience in Visual Studio. Um, I, re I realize that there's an intersection there, but I, I'm really keen to understand the motivation for this because, like I say, literally, if we, if we were to go and build the new native graphical designer for Visual Studio, that would potentially mean we're not doing something else that you guys also want, and so... So I'm trying to. There's probably going to be challenges anyway, though, Josh, with the, the Visual Studio. But if you're offline, because you know a Logic app's all about um, important swagger, and swagger's going to be 
in the Azure portal for most of the marketplace anyway, isn't it? So the, the, no, I, 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 uh, I am aware of the technical challenges. <laughs> okay, I think let's move on. I think there are a few more questions. Yeah. These are great, though, by the way, guys, and I hope I hope this um, this exchange, this frank exchange, is is what you're hoping to see, um, because it really does help us. Hopefully, you're seeing why the prioritization and understanding the motivation behind the request is important for us. Uh, yep. Next question. Yeah. Okay. The next question is from Stephen Thomas and Manu. Um, what is the best way to achieve a more PubSub approach using app services rather than point to point and also durable messaging support? Yeah, uh, so we, sure. So this, these will be taken on with the, the messaging patterns that we need to do. We have a list of the key messaging patterns that we, oh, I'm running low on battery, um, uh, the key messaging patterns that we need to support and PubSub and so on is one of them. It is a little bit tricky in the current solution to do that. Um, in terms of durable messaging, obviously we have connectivity to um, service bus queues. We'll also add connectivity to Azure queues, and we have checkpointing built into our system. So uh, there is many elements of all the durable messaging stack there, but we realize that some of the patterns are missing. Okay. Uh... I think we are running over time. I don't know, like, uh, how many of you are okay, or you know, uh, Joseph is oh, well, yeah, the battery yeah. as well. Yeah. So, what, what, how should we do it? Like, there are a, a lot of questions there. Uh, we definitely we won't be able to cover it today. Uh, what, what should we do? Like, uh, any suggestions on the chat window? Do you want to, should we just schedule a follow-up in a couple of weeks and we carry on doing another Q&A? Yeah, I think a repeat um, session sometime again, another session would be nice. Yeah, I think probably that that's the way that, that will work, uh, Josh, because it's all about uh, 75 minutes already now. So, and there are a lot of folks in New Europe, it must be nearly 10 o'clock. Uh, so what uh, what we'll do is I will me and Mike will uh, discuss and maybe we'll we'll slide in one more session maybe in a week or uh, two weeks maybe we'll do one more uh, this offline Wednesday thing uh, which is not our regular Monday thing and people can join yeah yep sounds it sounds good um, I I just want to say thanks as well for everyone who joined and asking all the questions. Um, it's great for me to get visibility of what's on your mind. This is a fantastic channel, so I appreciate being invited and getting the chance to engage with you guys. Hopefully you appreciate the kind of honest exchange and the um, ability to provide input directly to us. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to do it. Okay, thank you very much, Josh, for taking Yeah, cheers, time. Josh. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Cheers. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye now. Cheers.